What's going on guys? This is Rob and I'm like 99% sure that Avengers King Dynasty is basically going to be Avengers Forever by a different name. So we're going to cover that story, right? It might also have a little dash of Exiles World Tour, right? Just a little pinch thrown in there for seasoning, right? Just for flavor. But still, uh, we're going to cover Avengers Forever. This is the original from 1998. Yes, Marvel's doing one from 2022. It's okay. So here's the thing. Uh, this story basically picks up with a couple things that we need to explain. The first is the Supreme Intelligence and the second is Rick Jones. So the idea behind Rick Jones and really seemingly the whole reason why this story is happening actually takes place in the prelude to the beginning of Avengers Forever, which is basically a guy by the name of Jones Ricard, who literally just launches an invasion against another world, freezes everybody in time, and then sends his forces, which are kind of modeled after the Avengers, to slaughter everybody. So he literally kills everybody while they're frozen in time and they can't move. And he does it because they had some kind of a rebellion there. The way he's able to do this is by utilizing something called the the destiny force and we'll talk about that here in a second but focusing on the supreme intelligence literally when kurt busick started writing the avengers in like issue number seven there was a group called the lunatic legion which were just these crazy kree members who were residing on earth for a while they ended up grabbing the supreme intelligence who was at the center of the earth and then brought him to the blue area of the moon where there's oxygen and then they intended to like rebuild or bring back the the kree empire by turning humans into kree was it a good story no not really but that's why the supreme intelligence is here on the blue area of the moon. The reason why that matters is because the Avengers bring Rick Jones to the Supreme Intelligence to see if the Supreme Intelligence can't figure out what's going on with Rick Jones. The reason for this goes all the way back to the 1970s with a story that Marvel wrote called the Kree Scroll War. And this is exactly what it sounds like, a war between the Kree and the Scrolls. The way the conflict came to an end is that the Supreme Intelligence woke up the powers, woke up the destiny force inside of Rick Jones, which allowed Rick Jones to basically end the conflict and then those powers were taken away by the Supreme Intelligence again, but the war ultimately ended. The Destiny Force itself is like this ridiculously enigmatic thing in Marvel Comics that's really more of a plot device than anything else. The way it played out with Rick Jones is that back in the day in Marvel Comics, the idea was that Rick Jones was very similar to Bruce Banner and the Incredible Hulk in the sense that Rick Jones was fused with Captain Marvel of the Kree. So when Marvel wasn't running around and doing his thing, he was Rick Jones. Rick Jones would turn into Marvel and then he would be a superhero. Literally, he would slap his Negabands together and like that's how that would work right like wonder woman hitting her bracelets together but doing more than blocking bullets so the thing about this is that the the destiny force of rick jones would intermittently pop up here and there and the destiny force represents like the sum total of what humanity is capable of right like the greatness of what humanity can achieve manifests in the form of a source of power that rick jones can use that's what jones rickard was using at the beginning of the story and that's what rick jones can somewhat channel of course jones rickard has his own character and we'll talk about him here in a little while but the event Avengers bringing, uh, bringing Rick Jones to the Supreme Intelligence is based on the idea that the Supreme Intelligence can understand Rick Jones on a very fundamental level. But of course, the Supreme Intelligence tells the Avengers, leave, right? Like, if you guys want me to check this guy out and figure out what's going on with him, I need to do it in privacy without you guys standing around and watching because you're a bunch of weirdos. And so ultimately, the Avengers end up leaving here. This leads to the arrival of an enigmatic character that we don't really know anything about, who's just kind of watching these things unfold and is kind of talking to the Supreme Intelligence about how how Rick Jones and his use of the Destiny Force is moving humanity towards a precipice where they will kind of evolve into the next state of evolution to a higher state of being and in turn achieve an incredible level of power. The problem here is that there are those out there that will not want to see this happen. And this comes in the form of Immortus making his move. Now, let's talk about Immortus and Kane the Conqueror and Ramatut and Iron Lad and all that kind of stuff. Let's clear all this up. So the way this worked is that in the 30th century, you had a guy named Nathaniel Richards. Nathaniel Richards grew bored with his timeline and decided to go back and conquer the world by conquering ancient Egypt. He called himself Ramatut. The Fantastic Four realized what he was doing, traveled back to the past, and then defeated Ramatut. That led to him having to go back to the 30th century. He ended up overshooting the 30th century and landed in the 31st century. And so because humanity was really primitive, surrounded by advanced technology, he seized control of the technology and then conquered the 31st century and changed his name to Cain the conquer. Following that, he had a whole bunch of different campaigns where he was calling himself the Scholar Centurion and he was trying to defeat the Avengers and different things like that, and he always lost. During this time, one of the things he did is he visited his younger self and he told him, you're going to have to make decisions X, Y, and Z in order to ensure that you become me. His younger self didn't want to do that. He wanted to become his own superhero. So that led to his younger self calling himself Iron Lad. Now, as for Immortus, that's explained in this story. So we'll get there soon enough. So what ends up happening here, kind of getting 
getting back to our story, where you have basically Rick Jones just kind of sitting there in the presence of the Supreme Intelligence, what ends up happening is that Immortus makes his move by freezing time in that area, like literally freezing time all over the place, like the Earth itself, everything's frozen. And then he in turn sends out his, his main force Tempest, right? This guy that basically does the bidding of Immortus when he doesn't want to get his hands dirty. Tempest shows up here and tries to kill Rick Jones. But in the middle of that, a time bubble forms that actually allows Rick Jones to wake up from being frozen in time, only for Tempest to realize Kang the Conqueror is there and Kang the Conqueror is the one who created that time bubble in the first place. Now, the whole reason why this happens and even the whole reason why Immortus is doing what he's doing is not something that we're readily aware of at the moment. Instead, what ends up going on is that Tempest tries to destroy Kang and Kang destroys Tempest. But following that, Immortus basically says because Tempest was constructed out of limbo, all Kang has done is literally create a portal. And that basically allows Immortus' army, which is called the Army of the Ages, to pour in to where Kang the Conqueror is at. Now, the Army of the Ages is quite literally an army of people from just different points in time. So this army is composed of samurai and knights from the Dark Ages and conquistadors and the whole nine yards, right? Even like World War I and World War II soldiers, right? Just people who by whatever manner and whatever means have sworn allegiance to Immortus and in turn gone forward and done their own thing. To compare this to the MCU, in the trailer in Ant-Man Quantumania at the time we're recording this video, when basically Kang tells Scott Lang he can give him more time and presumably Scott Lang temporarily enters the service of Kang, imagine that service never ended. And that's how the Army of the Ages works, right? Literally, he just ensnares you in and keeps you there. Now, Kang initially wages a one-man war against the entirety of the Army of the Ages, but it's a war of attrition. Kang can't fight them all forever. And so as Rick Jones starts to wake up, Kang makes this last-ditch plea and says, use your powers, your destiny force, whatever it is, and find a way for us to get out of this. And so Rick Jones, not fully realizing what he's doing, ends up snatching Avengers out of different points in time. And the Avengers being time displaced emerge here, right? They literally arrive in this location. That's why this is important, and that's why I say that Avengers Kang Dynasty is basically going to be Avengers Forever by a different name. Instead of the Avengers just being plucked out of time, imagine they're plucked out of time and from other realities, and that's really how that works. So it's entirely possible that we may actually get the Tom Cruise Superior Iron Man. But of course, following this, these Avengers are familiar with each other in the sense that they recognize each other, but they don't know each other because they're not all from the same point in time. And so the result of this is that they do temporarily ally themselves alongside Kang, who literally tells them, I'm not your enemy, I'm your friend, at least here in the moment. We have to find a way to destroy the army of the ages, or at the very least, get Rick Jones out of here. Because as long as he's here, Immortus will find a way to destroy him. And it's inevitable that Immortus will kill him. So the only way to keep Rick Jones alive is to take him outside of time, to remove him from the time stream, which is the one place that Immortus simply just can't go. And so what this does is it leads to the Avengers sort of pairing together, working together, and of course, defeating the army of the ages just long enough for Immortus to realize that with the aid of the Avengers and the fact that it's almost like fighting an army of kings, that this is a stalemate. There's no way he can conceivably win. And so ultimately he pulls his forces out, they all withdraw, and then Kane the Conqueror basically tells them, get Rick Jones out of here, right? Like find a way to get him out of here. And Kane the Conqueror ultimately ends up leaving. Now this leads to the arrival of the cloaked figure who was talking to the Supreme Intelligence that we didn't fully know who it was. And he basically reveals his identity as being Libra. Now the funny thing about this is that Libra doesn't matter and he never really has. Uh, he was a character from like back in the day in Marvel Comics when you basically had a group of criminals called the Zodiac. For the longest time, he was billed, at least under the Roy Thomas days, he was billed as a guy who could potentially be maybe a credible threat to the Avengers, kind of. That's one thing to understand about Marvel back in the day, right? Back in like the 60s, 70s, and kind of in the 80s. Before Chris Claremont took over the took over the scene with like his X-Men run and started introducing like villains that were really interesting and compelling, it was by and large just villains of the week, right? There were a lot of things going on behind the scenes. And you'll find out what that is with the Comics Explained podcast. Yes it's on its way. So the thing about this is that Libra was just a guy who was there. The way this is being reworked by Kurt Busiek is it's saying that Libra, despite his criminal activities, was more interested in like balance and he was more interested in gaining knowledge and that kind of stuff. And that's why he's here more as a guide than anything else. But again, because the Avengers are kind of boxed into a corner, they don't fully understand what's going on with this whole situation and all they know is that Kang, who was a one-time enemy, has now turned ally, that they basically need to, to do what it is that this guy 
Popeye says, right? Because it's seemingly their best chance to make it out of all of this in one piece. And so leaving the current timeline and stepping outside of time, they're now outside of the multi or really out of the outside of the universe itself. But we also end up getting this sort of breakdown of who these different members of the Avengers are. Of course, you basically have two Hank Pym's running around. The one that was plucked out of time is the Hank Pym, who was basically going crazy back in the day when he was calling himself Yellow Jacket. But the other part here is we're actually introduced to Songbird. Now, Songbird was at one point a villain. Specifically, she became big in the Thunderbolts. She ended up reforming and becoming a superhero, but nobody quite is really quite sure what to make of her. But they're all kind of just plucked out of these different moments, and there's no real rhyme or reason to it, right? It's not like what we've seen in more recent stories coming out of Marvel, where they're plucked from like the moment when they're about to die, right? It's just one of those things where they were just sort of snatched up because Rick Jones just grabbed them in a panic. But the fact that they're all here, even with Captain America himself, his story is intriguing. He was plucked out at a point when he was facing off against Secret Empire. And that was a story that Marvel wrote where Captain America actually ended up chasing down number one, who was the leader of Secret Empire. That old team actually didn't use names. They used numbers to basically differentiate a kind of ranking system. But one of the, really the leader of the Secret Empire had actually infiltrated the US government and was working to bring the US government down. That was the inspiration that uh, Nick Spencer used for the Secret Empire story that he wrote 40 or 50 years later in more recent years that focused on Captain America. The thing about this is that number one actually ended up off of himself because he didn't want to be taken prisoner, which is kind of how the members of Secret Empire function. But Captain America was painfully disillusioned with the combination of the United States government and just being a superhero in general. That led to him kind of stepping away from the role of Captain America for a time and then eventually coming back. But the overall gist of this is that the team is hodgepodge, right? They're all just kind of thrown together in an impossible situation and no one quite is quite sure what's supposed to be happening here and no one really even understands what's going on here. And so what ends up going on here is that with the questions asked, where do they go and what do they do? Because they can't just hang out outside of time forever. They end up consulting Rick Jones because he's kind of the decision maker if for no other reason than the fact that they're the ones that are supposed to be keeping him safe. And so the result of this is that Rick Jones decides that if Kane the Conqueror was able to protect him, even if only for a moment, against the forces of Immortus, then what safer place to go than to go to Chronopolis where Kane the Conqueror resides? The problem is that once they get there, they end up finding that Immortus is already attacking Chronopolis because in his mind, it was the most logical place for them to go to. Now, some of this also has to do with the fact that because Kane the Conqueror sits outside of time, he sees all time simultaneously. But at the same time, there are a few things going on behind the scenes that actually keep him from being able to know exactly what's supposed to happen. And so that's why time travel to a degree in this story is kind of used as a plot device more so than anything else. But the Avengers showing up here to Chronopolis, they're able to kind of fend off some of the forces of, uh, of Immortus. But the whole idea is to actually get Rick Jones inside of Chronopolis and to Kang directly in order to figure out what to do here. The result of this is that as they finally get inside where Kang is, is, Kang is actually in the process of effectively evacuating. That his forces here facing off against Immortus is really more of a stopgap measure. He doesn't really have any intention of saying like, sure, we can win this. He knows he can't because the forces of Immortus are endless. They're literally plucked from the time stream and they could stretch on forever. So again, a war of attrition. That's why he's doing things. Like he rebuilt the Sphinx that he used previously to travel back in time as Rama Tut. He's actually kind of rebuilt that and he's moving it to a safer location. But as the Avengers arrive here, the response of Kang is, this is the last place you should have come to, right? Like, it makes the most sense that Immortus, in an effort to keep me from interfering, would strike at the one place that I use the most. But the other part of this is he says Chronopolis is a very particular place, a very important place when it comes to time travel. And the reason why is because traveling back and forth through time and traveling into the past does not allow you to change the past, right? So for example, Kane the Conqueror cannot travel back into the past and destroy all the Avengers before they ever became Avengers, right? He can't do that and then guarantee his rise to power. What that would do is it would create alternate timelines. Say that he killed five Avengers before they ever became Avengers. Now you've got five different timelines where each one of them never became Avengers. Then you've got an infinite number of timelines on how those things could have played out based on those Avengers not coming into existence, right? So the result of this is he tells Janet Van Dyne, the only thing that ever happens is that when you go back and try to change the past, you create branching timelines. And he says, that's the beauty of Chronopolis. Chronopolis allows me to travel back into the past and actually modify the past 
in order to affect the present day and the future. It's why Immortus is attacking this place, because at the core of this place is literally what will become the Forever Crystal, the source of energy that powers the entirety of this citadel, and if Immortus gets his hands on it, then Immortus can start wiping out different universes across the multiverse. He can just start ending things, right, or just changing the past and affecting everything else. It allows him complete and total mastery over all of the timelines. And so while the Avengers are able to enjoy a bit of respite while they're here at Chronopolis, meaning they can basically experience some R&R, &R, the fight's back on again when Immortus sends his forces in yet again. And so as they're facing off against these guys, that's when Kang tells them, this is a stopgap measure. We cannot hold Immortus off forever. Eventually, he is going to overtake the Chronopolis, and if Rick Jones is here when that happens, it's game over, right? And so what it does is it leads to the uh, to the Avengers seizing control of the Sphinx of Kang, taking off into the time stream, while at the same time, Immortus finally manages to break into Chronopolis, and as he does, he overpowers Kang the Conqueror and then seizes the Heart of Forever and then rechristens it into the Forever Crystal. And what it allows him to do is to literally take the entire 31st century where Kane the Conqueror rules with Chronopolis and absorb everything into the Forever Crystal. All beings who are present in that location are now confined there. The issue is that Immortus thought that the Avengers and Rick Jones were still in that vicinity. Once he realizes that's not the case, now it's a hunt, fighting a war on two fronts. One part is Immortus going through and literally pruning the time stream, eradicating timelines that don't need to exist. The other part of it is trying to find Rick Jones and the Avengers because seemingly the level of power Rick Jones has through the Destiny Force is the one thing that can stand in the way of Immortus and his campaign. Now what's kind of ironic about this is that as they're able to make their escape, Libra keeps kind of telling them like we should do this or we should do that, we should consider trying to find a way out, but the funny thing here is that Hawkeye just kind of lashes out at Libra. Now of course Libra's response here is man you're hurting my feelings and the response of Hawkeye is I'm gonna hurt a lot more than that if you don't get out of here, right? So ultimately he chases off their guide. They're quite literally flying blind throughout the entirety of the multiverse. And so what is up happening here is both Hank Pym's seize control of the navigation systems for the Sphinx, and they pick up on the fact that there are three chronal anomalies taking place throughout the history of the universe. Somebody's messing with time in a significant way at three points in time in the universe's history. And so this leads to the group splitting into three separate groups in order to investigate these particular points in time. Now, the first group to emerge is the modern day Hank Pym, along with Captain America, who show up in the 21st century New York City, right? Manhattan specifically. And as they get there, the whole place is a wasteland, right? Like Martians are laying waste to the entirety of the area. They're literally killing everybody, right? Like everybody's more or less been destroyed. What's funny about this is this actually was inspired by the War of the Worlds. And so as they make their way through there, Captain America's and of course Ant-Man are fighting against some various forces. They're able to hold their own to a degree, but when there's a spot that's open where Captain America's almost taken out, he's actually saved by the Avengers of this timeline which basically turns out to be led by Black Panther. But the other part about this is this Black Panther here is actually T'Challa. It's the real T'Challa, who's of course older and he's a lot more grizzled and hardened than he used to be. But what he basically explains is that somewhere along the line, a massive conflict took place and the Martians started invading and like the Avengers were basically killed. So seeing Captain America here takes him by surprise because Steve Rogers is supposed to be dead. Now Steve Rogers of course fesses up right off the bat and says, well, I'm not from this time stream home slice. Uh, I am from like back in the day. Now the other group that comes together is Hawkeye and the past Hank Pym along with Songbird who end up in the Old West. Now the funny thing about this is Songbird knows how this whole situation plays out. And so what you end up coming up on is like the Two-Gun Kid and these characters who are basically older characters that Marvel used to used to publish way back in the day when like Stan Lee was the one-man show who was basically creating everything. And this led to them basically focusing on like Western comics and things like that. Two-Gun Kid's not really important. He hasn't been for a long time in Marvel Comics, but this is basically a point where Kang is trying to conquer this part of history in the 19th century. Songbird's just kind of like, all right, look, we gotta go. Like, we don't have time to face off against Kang here. Besides, I know how this plays out. Some Avengers show up here. They defeat Kang the Conqueror. He goes back to his time and like the day's safe. So there really isn't anything for us to do here. So they end up basically bailing out. But when they get back to where their time sphere is supposed to be, it's gone, right? Somebody took it. And so the third group is Genus Vell, also known as the new Captain Marvel, along with Janet Van Dyne. We don't really need 
to go to specifically in the genus Vel. He's kind of the roundabout son of Marvel. I want to say that he was created, right? He was literally cloned from Marvel, but I'm not going to swear to that off the top of my head. Honestly, I'm not overly familiar with him because he hasn't been relevant in Marvel Comics for like 25 years, but literally he's just the new cosmic powered Avenger who's plucked out of time by Rick Jones and was brought here, right? So it's not overly important with this character. The thing about this and what's really kind of crazy is where the story sort of goes off the rails a little bit that Richard Nixon is on the campaign trail because this is 1959 and uh, Marvel realizes that it's not actually Richard Nixon, that it's a scroll pretending to be Richard Nixon. But what matters here is that where Genus Vell initially goes to make a move against basically Richard Nixon, the vice president of the United States, <laughs> <laughs> he goes to attack the guy knowing that he's a scroll. that Avengers end up stepping in here. Now this Avengers team, they originally appeared in What If Issue Number 9 back in March of 1978. They were actually uh, uh, an Avengers team that was brought together by Jimmy Woo and actually served as more of like a presidential guard. Initially it dealt with a villain named Yellow Claw who tried to kidnap President Dwight Eisenhower and take him out. Of course, the Avengers basically came together and defeated him and saved the president. And following that, they remained as kind of a detail. At this point in time, they're basically protecting Richard Nixon. But again, they're not an overly important team. 3D man, like the guy who's in the weird looking getup, he's okay, right? He's he's interesting. You have a few recognizable characters here, but none of these guys are overly important, right? Pulling a page out of and really kind of talking about the future of the MCU. This could be yet another Avengers team that we've never seen before that exists out there in the multiverse. So that's why these kinds of things are really, really cool and they're really fascinating because what you're dealing with here is not only the, uh, the manipulation of time, but the jumping in and out of alternate realities here. Now, of course, each one of these groups has their own individual stories, and so focus on, on this old What If Avengers team, meeting the Avengers team that's currently trying to figure out what's going on with these time anomalies, that the Time Avengers, we can call them that in order to keep that separation simple, they basically reveal that Richard Nixon's a scroll, and that the Avengers themselves just kind of take the Time Avengers at their word. But they also kind of say, look, I mean, this is sort of what's going on here, something that you have to be aware of, that the idea of the scrolls being here is to literally sabotage the United States space program. That's the whole point, in order to keep humans from going into space when they did. But of course, once this revelation comes out, then the Avengers tell the Time Avengers, okay, we're on your side, we'll stop fighting, we gotta find a way to deal with Richard Nixon. Now, jumping back to the Avengers in the West, what they end up finding out is that it was actually Kane the Conqueror who, at that point in time, is trying to conquer the 19th century and has somehow become aware of the fact that they're there. He's the one that stole their sphere. So when they get back there, like, a Kang hologram kind of taunts them a little bit and then tries to collapse the cave-in, Songbird's able to save them, but that leads to the arrival of the Gunhawks, right? So you basically have the Black Rider, you've got Reno Jones, Kid Cassidy, right? You have these old Western characters that are here trying to help them out as best they can and saying, okay, obviously Kane the Conqueror is the guy who's the main villain here. Let's deal with him and then we'll find a way to get you guys back to your normal time. I mean, they're old Western superheroes who are running around with, with revolvers. Like, what are they going to do? But the thing about this and the, the kicker about all this is that you have Hawkeye, who's a massive fan of like old Western. And he's a massive fan of these guys, right? He's like, I, I spent my whole life reading about you, studying your history. It's so fascinating to be able to meet you. You can't imagine how impossible this is. And when Kid Cassidy's like, yeah, man, I mean, it's a cool experience. Hawkeye says, especially because Kid Cassidy was dead by 1873. So that's when he realizes it's not Kid Cassidy. It's somebody posing as Kid Cassidy. And he tells the Avengers, like, hit him, right? So literally, it's just like he takes out Kid Cassidy. And he's like, get him, guys. And like the Avengers ensnare these guys only for us to find out that they're basically space phantoms and the space phantoms are forces of immortals in the old school comics there was only one space phantom that was ever encountered as a as a kind of servant of immortus what this shows is he's got a whole host of them the bigger point here and the reason why this matters is because it demonstrates immortus has spies everywhere all over the place that there's no way to know because the space phantoms are shapeshifters so there's no way to know if the person standing next to you is a space phantom or if they're basically the person they've always claimed to be and that's the concern that they initially have. When you go back to the to the situation with Richard Nixon, that you've got the Time Avengers and you've got the regular Avengers who are all kind of meeting. They're met with two FBI agents out of nowhere. Captain Marvel picks up on what's going on and realizes they're not FBI agents. He attacks them. They're space phantoms and those guys are defeated. But what's crazy is that before they can deal with that whole situation, Immortus arrives on the scene clutching the Forever Crystal and literally starts emanating this sort of chronal warp where he starts wiping out everything in existence from his point, spreading in an outward direction. He literally obliterates the entirety of the time stream and the universe. Those Avengers, the Time Avengers, make it out just in time. 
The other part of this is that the actions of Immortus are also impacting the 19th century where the other time Avengers are at. So they end up bailing out of there as fast as they possibly can. And so at this point, the only group remaining in the timeline that they had arrived at is Captain America and the present day Hank Pym. And so what they end up doing is actually traveling with Black Panther to the remnants of Wakanda, which has long since been a destroyed state. And what, what ends up happening is Black Panther literally says, because of the fact that these alien invaders are so incredibly advanced and our ability to chase after them following their defeat is non-existent because our planet doesn't have any sort of space travel technology anymore. He says, we can literally grab what's left of the vibranium in Wakanda and we can retrofit some vessels and then basically go after the Martians themselves. The problem here is that when they get there, because of the manipulations of Immortus, there's an entire race that operates within the subterranean realm right under Wakanda down in the Great Mound that feeds off the vibranium there. So to take what's left of the vibranium would wipe out that entire race. And so that is a point where now Black Panther at the behest of Captain America has to make a choice. Captain America's stance is either you can take what's left of this vibranium and you can wipe out this entire race and hope the ships that you retrofit will lead to you being able to launch an attack on the Martians and destroy them so they can never come back to Earth. Or you can leave this vibranium here. You can let this race continue on. You can hope the Martians never come back and you can start rebuilding Earth. Which one is it going to be? Ultimately, Black Panther ends up choosing to leave the race alone to let them stay within the subterranean realm of Wakanda, feeding off the vibranium, and then to try to rebuild the surface world, hoping everything can go back to normal. The cool thing here is that at this point in time, you haven't really seen Immortus making his move in the 21st century. He hasn't arrived here yet in order to do anything. And so what this does is it leads to Captain America and his guys basically heading back using their coronal vessel to the Sphinx and then reuniting with the rest of the Avengers. And so what ends up happening here is with the Avengers completely reunited, but realizing that Immortus is trying traveling through the time stream and wiping out entire universes, the only thing that they can do is actually head directly to Limbo and to try to fight him head on. What's really crazy about all of this is this is just the surface stuff, right? Like. The whole scheme of Immortus is much, much bigger than what's going on, or at least what we've initially been led to believe. That what we're talking about here is the presumed destruction and recreation of the entirety of the multiverse in Marvel Comics. What's going on guys, this is Rob, and at the end of this video, you guys are gonna have a perfect understanding of how like Kane the Conqueror, Immortus, how all that stuff works together. And like I said in the previous video that we did, this is basically going to be the plot mostly to Avengers Kane Dynasty, although I would argue Secret Wars may very well have some plot points from this. We won't fully know until we get closer and more information comes out. But as we covered in the previous video, that what you had were these time-displaced Avengers that have been brought together by Rick Jones. Now remember, while Rick Jones himself is not the main focus of Avengers Forever, the bigger focus here is what Rick Jones represents, which is the Destiny Force. That in Marvel Comics over the years, you had situations where by whatever manner and whatever means, humanity would somehow defy the odds and come out on top with this kind of human just ingenuity or just this desire to win or something along those lines. And what Marvel established, really Kurt Busiek with Avengers Forever, is that it's not simply that humanity just really has the desire to come out on top <laughs> because sometimes the desire to win just isn't good enough really good example of this is look at the Philadelphia Eagles they really wanted to win and they lost the Super Bowl anyway so the thing about this is that <laughs> I probably should have said that I've pissed off every single fan in Philadelphia <laughs> I'm sorry guys, but I had to. So here's the thing. The destiny force is kind of this idea that different human beings, really the human race in general, has a kind of innate energy about them that they can sort of tap into. And what we'll talk about over the course of this is exactly how that plays out. But the long and short is that this time displaced group of Avengers has been kind of playing like a cat and mouse game with Immortus, trying to find him, trying to stop him. And Immortus has always eluded them virtually every step of the way because he's a master of time. And so once they all consolidate their forces, they make the decision that instead of jumping from one universe to the next trying to find Immortus, they head straight to his base of operations. And so when they get there, they basically get to what's called the Nexus of Time. Now, for those of you guys coming from X-Men the Animated Series, if you remember the four-part episode, Beyond Good and Evil, where Apocalypse ends up in the Nexus of Reality, and he had that custodian guy who's red-haired and he's really, really weird, and then he turns into a guy who looks like Doctor Strange at the end of the, at the, end of the series, 
That was a mortise, and this is where they were at. <laughs> From here, you can literally enter in and out of any universe in existence across the whole multiverse. And so as they make their way through here, they find themselves kind of caught in like Penrose steps and different things like that, where it's really mind boggling because they walk up some stairs and then find themselves walking upside down, or it looks like everybody else is upside down. It defies the laws of physics by every standard of measurement. And so where it really kind of takes them off guard, what they find is that they all, all end up in their own individual prisons of sorts. Now, not everybody's story is unique here, but what is unique is actually Captain America coming across Nick Fury. Now, this is not the Nick Fury that you know. And again, this is not really a Nick Fury per se. It's more of Immortus just kind of toying with them to a degree. You'll probably see something like this in Kang Dynasty, right? This is a very high likelihood. And I would even argue, you'll probably see something like this in Quantum Mania. Not entirely sure that's the case, but I would bet that there's a possibility that this, that this will happen. But the thing about this is that this version of Nick Fury is the old school version. And the reason why Captain America is familiar with Nick Fury during this point in time is because in Marvel Comics, you basically had Nick Fury and his Howling Commandos. Now that was a comic book line that goes way back to the 1970s. It's been around for a long, long time. But the idea with Nick Fury is that before he became the agent of S.H.I.E.L.D. that we're all familiar with, he was literally just a guy in the military. He was Sergeant Fury. And what ended up happening is that Sergeant Fury and the Howling Commandos were tasked with going to Germany and grabbing a scientist who was developing a super soldier serum. That was, of course, Abraham Erskine. They successfully got him out of Germany. They extracted him from what was basically Hydra. They brought him here to the States, and then he gave the super soldier serum to Steve Rogers. So Nick Fury has a very important history in terms of Captain America becoming Captain America. But again, at this point in time, when Steve Rogers, with him knowing who Nick Fury is, it's because at this point in time, Nick Fury was a soldier during World War II. It's not until you get to the 1960s that he becomes an agent of S.H.I.E.L.D. Now, the reason why he maintained his longevity is because he ingested something called the Infinity Formula, which basically allowed him to stay youthful for an exceedingly long amount of time. Eventually, he lost it in Original Sin and then just became an old man, or it lost at some point along the line up to Original Sin. But of course, Captain America, as we talked about in the previous video, this is a version of Captain America that's plucked from his own timeline or from the, the Marvel Universe at a time when Captain America was becoming disillusioned. And so that's why this conversation between him and Nick Fury fills Captain America with a new level of resolve and a desire to save the other members of the Avengers and then go forward and confront Immortus. Now, everybody else gets their own kind of storylines to a degree, and they're interesting. They're not really overly important. None of it really matters. The only one that does matter here, though, is the events involving Yellow Jacket. Because remember, you've got two versions of Hank Pym here. You've got the Hank Pym, which I call Hank Pym classic in Avengers Forever. He's one of the founding members of the Avengers with Janet Van Dyne. Then you've got crazy Hank Pym. He's the one that like lost his mind and he was going through all these existential crises, just all that kind of stuff, right? Just like the nuts. Hank Pym. Like, that's what we're talking about. And so it's one of those cool moments where once the team basically reconsolidates, they get back to their normal selves. You end up finding the classic Hank Pym, realizing that he'll eventually become the crazy Hank Pym, ends up allying himself with Immortus. And the reason why is because Immortus proposed this idea that if he allies himself with Immortus, that he can actually ensure a timeline comes to existence where Hank Pym doesn't go crazy. He doesn't end up becoming his just kind of nuts existential madman self. And so in effect, one of the members of the Avengers team have now defected to the side of Immortus. And so following this, we, we get a bit of an exposition here. And the reason why is because the Avengers start to realize that one of the space phantoms is masquerading as one of their own. And when the jig is up, right, when the, when the ruse is pulled, that you basically have the space phantom that starts offering this huge dump of information. Now, this is one of the reasons why this story is so incredibly important. Because up to this point in Marvel Comics, all we knew is that Kane the Conqueror was going to become Immortus, but we didn't know how. We didn't really know, there, there were no real dots connecting that, and what few dots we got contradicted everything else, right? It was just sort of weird the way it played out. But the thing about this, and what we find out, is seemingly almost every major issue that the Avengers have run into with Immortus has all been done for a very particular purpose. One of the first things we learn, though, is about the Space Phantoms themselves. The Space Phantom initially was just a singular being who was out there that the Avengers fought at one point in time and was kind of a prelude to, like, the arrival of Immortus, Tempest, and that kind of stuff. 
what we're told here is much like what you saw in the Loki TV show, where you have those individuals who are quote unquote pruned by the Time Variance Authority, and they end up basically at the very end of time on that planet, and they're ultimately consumed. This is similar to that. And in fact, the show borrowed from that. The way this works is that by whatever manner and whatever means, individuals will end up in the realm of limbo. They'll end up in basically the place where Immortus resides. Sometimes they stumble into it. Sometimes they cast magic, not knowing what they're doing. They pass through the portal. They end up here. Sometimes they get sent here by other people, right? Just whisked away to some dimension somewhere. And that dimension ends up being limbo. But whatever the case happens to be, over time, every single one of these people who were locked away here will eventually lose themselves. They'll forget who they were and their own world will forget who they were. And in losing their identity, they will ultimately become space phantoms. And that basically explains where they come from and why there's so many of them. And so when this huge revelation is given to us, what he also says is that all these different conflicts where Immortus has shown up here has all been done for one singular purpose. The Avengers facing off against Immortus, Immortus showing up and challenging different superheroes or initiating events. It's all been done for a singular purpose. And this has been done at the behest of the timekeepers that over the course of his existence, whenever Kang became Immortus, eventually he was met by the arrival of the timekeepers. And instead of him being lost to the effects of Limbo, much in the same way that the space phantoms were due to the intervention of the timekeepers and their ability to kind of safeguard and protect Immortus, that what Immortus would do is he would basically prune timelines based on what the timekeepers wanted. So again, referencing the Loki TV show, that's where these similarities come from. Now, their motivation will be explained over the course of this, and it's actually pretty nefarious, but that will be explained as time goes on. The long and short of this, though, is that as far as the timekeepers are concerned, humanity is the greatest threat that exists in the multiverse. And the reason for this is that at the moment, right, at the moment that this comic is being written, that humanity just has superheroes, the Fantastic Four, the X-Men, different people like that, that the most powerful beings usually are confined to teams and they protect humanity from whatever threats exist. But because of the nature of the destiny force, eventually humanity as a whole will achieve extreme levels of power, incredible levels of power they'll be able to tap into. What form that power will take isn't fully fleshed out here, but what is fleshed out is that with this new level of power, humanity will take to the stars. And when that happens, they'll start conquering entire worlds and so on. And basically in all these different universes across the multiverse, humanity ends up becoming a kind of conquering race. And so that's why when we did the last video at the beginning of the story, we covered that little segment where basically the Avengers showed up and conquered an entire world because that's what happens across multiple realities. And so in order to keep that from happening, or at least on the, on the surface, in order to keep that from happening, the timekeepers brought in Immortus to get rid of the timelines where that could potentially be the case by removing circumstances where humanity Humanity would take to the stars. Yes, different superhero teams on Earth have gone into space, but they never stay there. They always come back to Earth because the manipulation of Immortus behind the scenes was basically trying to keep humans confined to Earth so that if they never leave Earth, they never become a threat to the rest of the universe. The idea is they would never be able to channel the destiny force in an effective way. And so again, it's a, it's a really cool revelation here because it just talks about these extreme manipulations and they're far reaching. Right? It's one of the reasons why his character is so significant at Marvel, but it also really shows how in, just how immensely powerful he is. And that's something that I hope we take away from this, because if the Marvel Cinematic Universe handles Kane the Conqueror right, he'll be ridiculously OP, not by just physical strength or the ability to shoot energy or something like that, but because how do you stop a guy who can prevent you from being born or who could have your have some situation where like you're switched at birth and you're raised by a different family. And instead of becoming an Avenger, right, Captain America becoming an Avenger, Captain America is the guy who works in a tax office somewhere, right? Just things like that, right? Being able to alter the entire history of a universe or even just using the forever crystal wipe an entire universe out of existence right literally just 
blink it out just with a, with just like that it ceases to exist because one of the things to remember is that in Marvel Comics you have branch universe theory that alternate realities come into existence because something that happened in the main Marvel universe happened differently right a really good example of this is in Secret Wars in 1984 Peter Parker gets the Venom symbiote for the very first time it's not called the Venom symbiote but it becomes the Venom symbiote so there's an alternate reality out there where Peter never lost it and in fact there is a story where that happens and the symbiote it basically just consumes him. There's a point where the symbiote's blown off of his body and it's just literally bones. Like it, it had literally eaten his physical body. And so it's just the symbiote walking around with bones. It's pretty gruesome and it's pretty messed up, but that's an alternate reality now, right? What if this one thing had happened different? Now it's an alternate universe. So all Immortus has to do is go back to that moment when things deviated, when that branch happened and keep that event from taking place or just wipe the universe out entirely. There's any number of ways that he can pull that off, but that's what he's been doing over the course of time is working for the timekeepers by basically pruning entire timelines. But the problem with this is that seemingly the Avengers always end up finding a way to tra or to, to transition into space and humanity seems to always find a way to attain the destiny force and so what ends up happening is that with immortus and yellow jacket working together yellow jacket subdues the avengers and then when they wake up they basically find themselves in an alternate reality and that's one of the things to know when you're facing off against someone like immortus that in you know instead of like it being a normal circumstance like here right you get kidnapped and they drop you off in a field somewhere that you get kidnapped and you get dropped off three universes over right that's what you end up with that's why messing with somebody like like immortus or even kang is such a dangerous thing because you could just be thrown into the multiverse and you'll never make your way back you'll never get back to your home universe it's like sliders right it's like that tv show sliders but when the avengers wake up they kind of wake up in this different reality where again you have these kind of ironclad avengers who operate as like conquerors but what ends up happening is it's a quick realization these you know kind of uh, night, nightly Avengers, if you want to call them that, they don't see the real Avengers as actual Avengers. They see them as the Guardians of the Galaxy. Now, here's the thing. In Marvel Comics, kind of a quick aside here, in Marvel Comics, the Guardians of the Galaxy, as you know them now, which is like Peter Quill and like Rocket Raccoon and Groot and Gamora and all those guys, that's not the original Guardians. The original Guardians of the Galaxy were called the Guardians of the Galaxy 3000. They literally came from the 31st century, but this is that team. Right, this is like the original Guardians of the Galaxy 3000 team. They were, they're, at least they're seen as freedom fighters here. Individuals who are fighting against the conquering nature of the Avengers. And it's why they're immediately attacked. Now in the midst of all this, basically Hank Pym, or at least Yellow Jacket Hank Pym, steps in and basically helps them to uh, overcome these enemies and then reveals to them that the reason why they appear different was because of things called limbo bugs, which basically kind of cast an illusion and make things seem different than they actually are. But the important thing here is that this allows the Avengers to be taken prisoner and to actually be brought directly in front of the timekeepers themselves by Immortus. And this is a de facto trial. That's really all this is. That is the timekeeper speaking directly to the Avengers as basically uh, Immortus watches on. And this is when we get this really, really cool revelation here, right? This really cool explanation. There is a bit of discussion here in the sense that what you had was uh, being called He Who Remains at the very end of time. And in order to ensure the preservation of the time stream, he created the timekeepers in order to ensure that time flowed as it was supposed to, that all reality functioned the way it was supposed to in the, the coming of the new universe, right? Because that universe was effectively ending, but even the timekeepers themselves appear to be nefarious foes. And the reason for this is because over the course of this trial and in this conversation that they have, what the timekeepers say is exactly what we just talked about. They tasked Immortus with wiping out different timelines where the Avengers would transition to the stars, harness the power of the destiny force and become conquerors. And so in realizing this, what they decide is to basically purge any and all of those realities that exist out there and in fact every world or every version of earth across the multiverse will effectively be put on lockdown where humans would never be allowed to leave earth they would be forced to stay there now again the question of the avengers is but like why though because at the end of the day like 
we as the Avengers, like, we're good guys. We're superheroes. We would never become villains. And there really isn't even anything for us to, for you to worry about when it comes to us, because there are groups and individuals out there that are more powerful than us on Earth. But the response to the timekeepers is, you underestimate your level of power, right? Think about it. Of all the planets that exist in any one universe, and particularly in your main Marvel universe, Earth is the only world that was able to stave off Galactus that was able to hold Galactus back and in fact send him running in fear when like Reed Richards ran up on him brandishing the ultimate nullifier right like humanity has managed to hold off the judgment of the celestials it's one of these things where they're basically making this argument humanity is way more powerful than you think it is and it's only a matter of time before this destiny force will be harnessed by humanity and they'll basically destroy everything in existence or at least conquer entire universes and so when the questions asked by Captain America America, how, in how many universes does this take place? And the response of the timekeepers is, it happens 42% of the time. And that's when the Avengers are like, that's stupid, man. So like, you literally want to punish the entirety of humanity across the multiverse, confining us to Earth so we can never leave over the fact that only 42% of the time we become universal conquerors. And even if your job is to do nothing more than observe, then what does it matter? Because this is the natural flow of things. Arguably, it's how it's supposed to happen. So that's when they call the bluff of the timekeepers. And their argument is, it has nothing to do with justice. It has nothing to do with maintaining the flow of time or anything like that. This is you just trying to ensure that nobody gets in your way. You want to be the sole beings capable of, ru of like ruling the entire universe. That's really all you want to do. It's a mad grab for power and you're masquerading as a, as a group of people trying to do the right thing, trying to ensure that different universes across the multiverse all stay protected. Yeah, we call your bluff and that's not going to happen. Now, the other part of this and the big revelation that goes on here is Yellow Jacket, classic Hank Pym, that what had happened here is that him working alongside Immortus, it was not a ruse. He really intended to betray the Avengers. But when he realized what was going on with Immortus and the Timekeepers, which is to say that the 42%, right, those universes that exist out there where humanity would end up becoming conquerors, that the Timekeepers wanted to wipe those universes out, that the desire, or at least the intention of, of, uh, of Yellow Jacket, right, classic Hank Pym, was to turn against both Immortus and the Timekeepers. One, that's the reason why he was he freed the Avengers in the first place. And two, that's why he called for backup. When he realized what was happening, he sent out an SOS. Now this SOS comes in two forms. The first is Rick Jones and Kang the Conqueror alongside the Supreme Intelligence. Now, here's the cool thing about this. Kang the Conqueror arriving on the scene is no small thing because Kang is inevitably destined to become Immortus. But what you're talking about here are two guys who are able to manipulate the timeline. Now, which one is more powerful is one of the most debated things in Marvel Comics. Like, that debate rages across the fandom. It's, it just goes on and on and on and on, and I don't think we'll ever definitively get an answer to that unless Marvel creates one. But the reality here is that with Kane the Conqueror stepping in, the Avengers freed, Rick Jones being able to harness the power of the Destiny Force, and the Supreme Intelligence just sitting there as a giant head in a jar watching it all unfold, that the, uh, the Timekeepers basically summon their own teams. And so what you end up getting is basically the quote-unquote evil Avengers from across the time stream, all these different evil Avengers that you see or that we have seen showing up here and facing off against the good Avengers. And so in response to that, the good Avengers summon their own backup, which is basically every version or every every Avenger that exists in the multiverse literally coming in, right? Every single good guy showing up to face off every single bad guy. And that's why I say, this is probably what you're going to see in Kang Dynasty. That in Kang Dynasty and Secret Wars, you're going to see a whole host of evil Avengers. It's going to be amazing, right? It's going to be ridiculously cool. Just like multi like Avengers from the multiverse all fighting against each other, right? Just a giant thing. That's why it's going to be called Secret War, because it's going to happen all the way out there, and the average person is going to have no idea that it's taking place. But in the midst of all this, Immortus realizing that what the Timekeepers would do is not only eradicate the Avengers who were here, but even go so far as to just prune entire universes, can't tolerate it anymore. He can't side with this anymore. So in fact, he even he ends up taking the crystal, the forever crystal, 
and tries to hide it from the timekeepers, turning against them, refusing to let them destroy the Avengers. And a lot of this is because with Immortus having watched the Avengers for so long, having guided their actions, he almost sees them as his own children. Right? He, he almost feels very much like a parent. He's come to care about them and come to love them, even though what he was doing was a manipulation behind the scenes. And so when he turns against the timekeepers, the timekeepers eradicate him on the spot. They literally destroy him. And like, that's basically it. And so in the midst of this giant conflict between all these different Avengers, ultimately the good guys effectively come out on top. Now it's not for the timekeepers stepping in and like freezing everything in place, but with Kane the Conqueror being a guy who is literally protected from the time stream and the impact of time. Remember, you can't freeze Kane the Conqueror in place in time. It doesn't work that way. He's a master of time. All he has to do is just kind of like, not he just not be affected by it <laughs> because at all times his suit of armor allows him to operate in flux right it allows him to exist kind of outside the current effects of time and so this is the reason why even when the uh the timekeepers tr you basically freeze everybody in place by manipulating time kang the conqueror is not affected but realizing the 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 power of kang and realizing that he's like the last missing piece the last person that can manipulate the time stream and truly stand in their way the timekeepers try to basically turn Kang into Immortus. But what ends up happening is that with that version of Immortus having been destroyed, this is where the cleanup duty comes into play. That what Marvel does now is they say, actually Immortus as he exists from this point going forward is the result of the timekeepers trying to turn Kang into Immortus by literally speeding up his evolution. And then in turn, Kang the Conqueror resisting. And so what is, what's really told here is that in this effort to transform Kang, that you end up getting this almost kind of squelching sound right this tearing sound like flesh is ripped and Kane the conqueror himself remains his normal self the issue with this is that even though the timekeepers are trying to use this forever crystal to literally obliterate entire timelines by using its energy to fire a cannon that because they're so weakened now after having tried to force Kang into becoming Immortus, that ultimately Kang takes that moment to kill the timekeepers. He literally eradicates them on the spot. And so once the battle is concluded, Captain America, who now has possession of the crystal, ends up destroying it. And that when it's destroyed, everybody starts blinking back to their own individual timelines, right? They start going back to where they're supposed to be. And so you have this really, really interesting moment here where you basically have the rise of the new Immortus, right? Literally, this Immortus pops up here as having been kind of pulled away from Cain the Conqueror. So in essence, Kang and Immortus are the exact same person. That's the reason why now in Marvel Comics, you don't really see much discussion about Immortus being the person that Kang will become. Instead, it's Immortus referring to Kang as being Immortus, and it's Kang referring to Immortus as being Kang, because literally they're ripped out of the same person. Because literally what had happened here is in an attempt to turn Kang into Immortus, Kang resisted, and so that Immortus aspect of him was pulled away. It's not that dissimilar to Eve being made from the flesh of Adam, right? They're very similar things in that way. But the long and short of this is that with that crystal destroyed, everybody blinking back to their normal points in time, what we're told here is that the crystal represents a concept. It represents the idea of being able to manipulate and control time. And so what the crystal represents can never truly be destroyed. All it really did is destroy the physical form or the object that houses the power of the crystal. And so that power is kind of discorporated and it's out there, but we're basically told at some future point in time, it'll reform and it'll appear when it needs to. So it's really just kind of Marvel saying like, you'll see this kind of thing happen, right? It's like Battlestar Galactica, all of this has happened before and all of it will happen again. But again, that's the nature of the Avengers Forever story, is it's basically cleaning up the continuity of Kang and Immortus, Scarlet Centurion, Iron Lad, Ramatut, all that kind of stuff, all those different versions of Kang the Conqueror that we've seen over the years. It's clearing all that stuff up, while at the same time giving us a pretty interesting and compelling story. But once everything settles down and once everybody starts blinking back, the Avengers more or less say their goodbyes because they all just kind of go back to their own individual timelines and the story effectively ends there but again this is why i say like this is going to be the storyline that you see in like kane kane dynasty and probably avengers secret wars i'm like 99 sure this is what's going to happen but let me know what you guys think down in the comment section thank you all for watching and i will catch you all later peace